So uh, my name is Andre Forest, and I'm the project coordinator with the Manitoba Research Alliance, or the MRA, and the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. The Manitoba Research Alliance is a community academic partnership, and this research uh, that we're sharing today is funded by a partnership grant of the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council. The CCPA is a charitable, nonpartisan research institute and the lead organization for the Manitoba Research Alliance. So these organizations have been funding research that tackles some of the most wicked problems, helping to push the policy agenda in Manitoba and beyond. This event is held in part to publish one such research project, Indigenizing the Co-op Model, by Jim Thunder and Mark Intertas. This report and its summary are now live, and I'll provide a link shortly. While we meet today in a virtual platform, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the land on which we organize. I also recognize the Indigenous nations who've been stewards here since time immemorial, the Anishinaabe, Inunu, Ojikri, Dene, and Dakota. It is also the birthplace of the Métis, of which I am a proud member. The water many of us have flowing to our homes in Winnipeg uh, comes from Shoal Lake 41st Nation. Beyond recognizing land and water, I want to acknowledge the incredible and challenging work done by Indigenous scholars, activists, and community members who've been fighting for solutions to problems caused by ongoing colonial policies in Canada. The Manitoba Research Alliance and the CCPA have been lucky to work to challenge these policies alongside them. And I'm so pleased that some of them are joining us as panelists today, and I'm sure there's many more in the <laughs> audience. Um, just a bit of housekeeping before I disappear and help with the technical side of the event. Um, this event is set to run until about noon, but if the discussion is too good to stop, which I'm sure we've been part of some of those, um, the panelists have generously agreed to continue till about 12.15. If you have to go before then, rest assured, you can catch the rest of the, um, uh, of the discussion with the recording, which will be sent after the event. Um, the question and answer function is uh, enabled and others will be able to see your questions if you've got any. Anything mentioned um, in the chat is kind of for us in the background. So um, if you um, are able to mention something there, that'll be for the panelists. Um, we hope to have some time at the end of the event to answer one or two questions. Um, without further ado, I have the pleasure of introducing today's moderator and I'll be able to um, uh, share a bit about the panelists as well. Um, Crystal Labarero is a band member of Sapotewea Cree Nation and is the principal of Labarero Consulting. Presently, Crystal is on the board of directors of Assiniboine Credit Union, the Manitoba Blue Cross, and Homelessness Winnipeg and Indinaway. She was a project lead for Gani Gani Chick's report, Building Aboriginal Cooperative Capacity, and she has uh, such a wealth of knowledge in this area, and I'm so happy to have her moderating the panel today. Welcome, Crystal. Sorry, Andre, were you going to go ahead and introduce the rest of the panelists, or would you like me to do that? Um, sure, I can, I can do that for us today. <laughs> um, so Mark Intertes um, is uh, one of the authors of the report. So um, Mark is uh, immigrated to Canada from 2007 from the Philippines, where he learned about the importance of community and the challenges that poverty brings. His research interests are focused on cooperatives, community economic development, and legal issues concerning First Nations. In 2017, he completed a master's degree in city planning, focused on the role of cooperatives in Winnipeg's North End ur and urban revitalization. He graduated from the Faculty of Law at the University of Manitoba in 2020. Um, Jimmy Thunder is the uh, other report um, co-author and is an OG Cree Asper MBA graduate currently working as an economic and business development officer at the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs. He actively encourages public engagement with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's call to action as an adjunct professor at Horizon College via social media as the founder of Reconciliation Thunder and as a social media strategist for Circles of, for Reconciliation. Kathy Mallett is a longtime collaborator of CEDA and a key leader in the creation of many highly effective Indigenous institutions in Winnipeg's inner city. Two powerful themes running through Kathy's decades of work are the safety and welfare of Indigenous women and children and the importance of economic development and job creation. She led the creation of Payak Intertribal Housing Co-op, 
a 42 unit indigenous housing cooperative. Mary Nalungayak is the corporate secretary and vice president corporate services with Arctic Cooperatives Limited. She has over 20 years of experience in indigenous governance and has presented around the world on indigenous topics related to cooperatives and governance. She's represented the interests of Arctic co-ops and the members of that co-op um, at Cooperatives and Mutuals Canada, Federated Cooperatives, and the Manitoba Cooperative Association. She's a vital resource for information and insight on Inuit culture, values, and perspectives, and is a director of Seed Winnipeg. So now over to you, Crystal. Thank you, Andre. Um, well, welcome, everyone. What a wonderful, beautiful, sunny morning. I know it's a bit chilly out there, but uh, um, we're... Um, we've got a great hour ahead of us, so I, I think you're going to be quite um, pleased with what you're going to hear in terms of the research that's been done. Um, so what is a cooperative? Let's start there. And I, you know, there's, I was looking up a couple of different descriptions, but essentially it's an organization or a company that is owned and controlled by a group of its members um, who each all have a share in it. So essentially it's working and acting together for a common purposes, and it's guided by seven different cooperative principles. Um, so essentially that's what a cooperative is. I just wanted to briefly mention some of the work that I don't know if many of you have seen this document and it's a little reflective there, but um, so this is the work that I had been involved with uh, in terms of uh, Ganiganichik. So a number of years ago, back in 2008, I just wanted to give some history. Back in 2008, that was the start of the provincial um, cooperative strategy, and there was a, um, a, a, a significant consultation that was happening in the community in terms of looking at um, a provincial strategy for cooperatives. And at that time, there was very, very little consultation done within the Indigenous community. Mm -hmm. And um, a woman, a very strong woman in our community by the name of Leslie Spillett, who was the executive director of um, Gani Ganichik, um, um, got wind of this and basically um, had words at the province and said, you know, you know, it's really unfortunate that we're such a large population in Manitoba, but we were not consulted in the development of a provincial cooperative strategy. So... Um, Phase two of the of the um, development of the strategy happened in 2015, and at that point is when um, um, Leslie Spillett had approached me and asked me if I would consider participating, um, representing Ganiganichik, and participating on the steering committee that. Um, allowed for uh, a phase two of the consultation. But in addition to that, um, she had asked me to look at really developing a um, hands-on guide in terms of how we could engage more Indigenous people in cooperatives here in Manitoba. So that's how this document came to fruition um, and how I um, learned more about cooperatives. Uh, as you know from the bio that was just read is that I'm on the, the board, I'm actually chair of the board of Assiniboine Credit Union, which is one of the largest financial cooperatives in Manitoba. So I've been involved in cooperatives for a number of years, um, but I would say my eyes were um, opened. <laughs> Quite a bit as I embarked upon this journey of getting involved in the cooperative movement and, and really doing the research and, and finding out um, um, the value and the benefit of cooperatives and how that mixes with um, the values and benefits in, in, in our community. So with saying that, I just wanted to give you a little bit of a background in terms of how I came to be involved in that. But I think what I'd like to do next is I want to move over to Kathy. Kathy, can you tell us um, what the impetus for this project was and why is this so important? Well, I guess um, I could probably start with again a little bit of history too because I think people need to know uh, how these uh, projects come about and uh, the journey for this project started in 2015 so so you're saying you're the uh, provincial strategy committee was starting in 20 2008, I think you said? 2008. Okay. Yeah, so um, so we didn't get involved on this committee until that time period, 2015. And um, so we were there along with Crystal and a lot of other great people. And um, 
at that time, uh, there was a work plan that was developed and uh, our committee talked about lots of different aspects of co-ops and you know, uh, learning opportunities that maybe people could get involved in, uh, mentorship programs, etc. And one of the um, ideas that I, well, an idea that I had, a research idea, was the fact that uh, I always wanted to know uh, how would a co-op work in our community here in Winnipeg, in our Indigenous community. And, um, and so um, I knew a little bit about the co-op principles because I was involved with our Payuk Intertribal Housing Co-op back in the 1980s. And uh, so I knew a little bit about that. And, um, and so, um, so then we decided, at least, at least we decided as a small group to, to look at a research project on exactly looking at how would we indigenize the uh, co-op model in, and also looking at their, because uh, it comes from the Western part of uh, the world and uh and it's been in in canada for many many years this this co-op uh, model and um so we um we planned um to work with the uh canadian center for policy alternative and of course the manitoba research alliance because they have a lot of expertise in research and also they have um funding for uh to do research projects. And uh, we also also got involved with the Aboriginal Council of Winnipeg and we had asked uh, the council to see if they would support and do the administration side of the project. So that was done. So this cooperative work was very new to us. And, um, and so we uh, started and this is when we came in into working with Dr. John Loxley. Uh, John is, is a professor at uh, University of Manitoba in economics. And uh, he also, uh, his role with us uh, was guiding us uh, in our research around the co-ops, but also uh, in mentoring two of uh, the University of Manitoba students that were going to work with our research project, and that's Jim and uh, Mark. And uh, so that's when we started our relationship with him. And um, unfortunately, um, just this past summer, uh, John passed away uh, to great loss to many of us uh, as colleagues and also a loss to his family and many of his friends. And um, we just would like to also uh, dedicate this webinar to uh, Dr. John Loxley in his memory and um, a little later on uh, Mark and Jim will also share with us their memories of John when they collaborated with this research project. So that's kind of where things are at. <laughs> so I don't know if this might be a good opportunity um, for uh, Mark. Um, did you want to start and talk about your relationship with John? And, and this and then we'll go through um, then we'll move on to to some of the findings but I know this has been a significant um, uh, John's played a significant role in this project so we'll start with you Mark go ahead sure yeah thanks thanks so much Crystal um, yeah so so I met John when I was actually starting to to write my master's thesis for um, for my uh, master's in city planning degree and I was I was exploring the role of cooperatives in um, in urban revitalization and so one of the um, the co-ops that I wanted to study was Pollux hardware and and John um, was very instrumental um, in in that uh, in the development of Pollux so I I sat in his class I never actually registered in his class but I, I came in and I sat in in his class and he he got me connected to the people at Pollux so I could continue my research um, and then later on he he asked me if um, if I would like to to participate in this um, in this research project um, he has a special way of, of convincing people. He knew that you're interested in doing it, and but you may have other things that would stop you from, from participating. So he would ask 
the question in such a way that you couldn't resist it. And that's what he did. Um, and he just didn't give me an opportunity to, to, to uh, say differently. And so I, I, I knew I wanted to participate. And so, so I did. Yeah. That's wonderful. And Jim? Yeah, the same thing was true of me. Like you, at, uh, I didn't know where, uh, where the information session stopped and like the work that assigned to me be, had begun, you know, like it's just, he had that way of knowing that students are busy and you can't get a full commitment right off the bat sometimes, but, but he hooked us in and uh, yeah, just a great guy to work with. Um, I remember after one of our meetings, I think it was maybe the yellow dog or something. He was, uh, he asked for a ride uh, to the car dealership. And so uh, at this time, like I didn't know, uh, really like the significance of his of the work and his, his accomplishments and so I found out that he was involved uh, with um, you know the apartheid movement in South Africa and so mm -hmm. I was joking with him and I says like wow like of course look here right I, I, I get the honor of driving the Dr. John Moxley <laughs> you know and so he's, he was laughing with me and saying that I should shoot my uh, shoot my in my sights a little higher but uh, yeah. <laughs> the thing about uh, the thing about John is that uh, you know, as we were working through the research, I was asking him, uh, I became really cognizant of the scope of the project and just how much research is needed for something like this to be done right. And so I was, I was asking him about, you know, like how many pages do we need for this lit review and, and what should we expect people to know already? And he didn't give us what you would expect from, like, you know, like an academic, like asking a professor, he didn't give me a page count or anything. He just said, like, what do you think that people need to know? And I think that that was, uh, is a pretty, uh, you know, it's shaped not only the research that I did, but also just my own personal learning because it took it away from just being a project that we were doing um, and something that where the significance became extremely important. Like, how is this going to impact the community? How is it going to make things better for people? And uh, so, yeah, I just, just really the research and the lit review just really blew up. And, and uh, for my own personal learning, that was, that was really beneficial for me. And, uh, yeah, just as a result of his guidance, like I've, I've just, I've never stopped researching, I've never stopped learning, and I've never stopped, uh, you know, as he was doing with his career, just trying to make the community a better place. And so just really appreciate his leadership. Thank you, Jim. You know, it's evident that uh, um, he has definitely had a huge impact, not only on our community, but on students and individuals. So thank you for sharing a little bit about that. So let's move on here. Um, so I'm going to pose a question to both Mark and, and, and Jim, and it's a question for the authors. Can you take us through the most important elements of your research and the key findings? And I'm not sure who I'm going to turn it over to yet. <laughs> Who's going to start? Uh, I guess I could jump in, into it first. I think like the most important uh, element, uh, it's, it's really difficult to say because um, I think that the, the lit review is, uh, it was really important. It's foundational because there's so many things like a, a lot of people, when you look at economic development, you, there's like this stereotype of indigenous people as empty vessels that need to be filled, but there are resources in and of themselves. And I think the lit review was it's really important to look at the colonial context and the reason for which we need economic development. And uh, so I think that without having that foundation, then uh, you can really steer the conversation in a wrong way, you know? And so I, I would say that is really important. And, but also even just uh, what we're gonna talk about in our presentation is uh, the indigenous elements of success model and just looking at how indigenous peoples themselves define success and uh, what development is and uh, that type of a thing. And so, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in the presentation. Okay. And, and I would just like to, to add to that, that um, we, we came to a lot of realization um, in regards to, to the accessibility of, of things. Um, so the problem is not with the people who's trying to enter into uh, a business or into the cooperative model, uh, but there have been a lot of challenges with the accessibility of starting a business, uh, starting a corporation or an enterprise or a cooperative. It's, um, it's just a highly complex matter. Um, and sometimes the, the assistance may not be available to, to the people who, who would like to engage in that process. Thank you for that. Um, so I understand we have a presentation that you're going to share share on your screen. I do. Um, all right.
So um, I could, I guess, start with, with our presentation of, of our research finding. Um, the, the, the title of the, the research that we did with, with Professor uh, Loxley is the Indigenizing the Carpative Model. And as uh, Kathy has alluded to at the beginning, um, there's, there's been a little bit of a history uh, up to the development of this research project, and it's still continuing on um, with more research questions that are popping up as we, as we uncover more, more information. Um, yeah, so, so in, in essence, um, Kathy and a few other uh, people, uh, John, um, had this uh, question in their heads on, on um, the similarities between the indigenous cultures and the, the principles that guide the cooperatives. Because at, uh, at first glance, uh, they seem to be in synergy and they agree with each other. Um, however, uh, they've also noted that uh, it appears that there's not a lot of cooperatives um, in, in Winnipeg or, uh, or in, uh, as well as in certain provinces in, in Canada as well. And so they wanted to, to know um, what, are, what is causing this problem, um, as well as they wanted to be able to, to create this model wherein the synergies between Indigenous cultures and the principles of uh, cooperatives can actually be blended together um, so that we could hopefully uh, encourage more Indigenous peoples to uh, to engage in, in the creation and the uh, operation of a cooperative. And so to, to conduct the, the research project, we did what um, most research projects would do. Uh, they, they look into literature review uh, in which uh, works of John Loxley uh, was very instrumental. Uh, we of course uh, conducted interviews with uh, elders, uh, people who work uh, in the cooperative, indigenous people who were engaged in cooperatives, uh, as well as government uh, officials, um, lawyer. Uh, there was one lawyer who we talked to who was uh, uh, instrumental in, in creating cooperatives, and she was, uh, she was one of the few lawyers to, to actually knew how to incorporate a cooperative. Uh, most interestingly, uh, for at least for me, uh, is the design workshop, wherein what we did is we invited people, indigenous people, to come in and we asked them to try and uh, visualize a business or an enterprise that they would produce and how uh, that might look like, how they would govern it, uh, what kinds of decisions would, would be made and how would they make those decisions. Um, and so that was our way of uh, understanding how an indigenous person uh, living in Winnipeg in this uh, case uh, might actually create a cooperative and what are, and how would they, they in, um, how would they take their culture and infuse it uh, into the enterprise that they were making or cooperative that they were making. And so this is um, just a little bit of a, a, a graph that, that we have that shows uh, the situation of indigenous cooperative. The, the, the numbers that we got here were probably sometime around, uh, was, was from 2012 or 2013. Um, so, so what we did here is that we, we, we standardized the number of uh, membership in indigenous cooperatives based on the number of indigenous populations so that we could see the difference um, in um, you know, per province on who's, who's, who has the most cooperatives uh, or membership in cooperative. And we could see that Northwest Territories um, is, is high up there. Saskatchewan, uh, again, is high up there. Uh, Quebec and BC. And Manitoba um, isn't really doing fairly well, but it's not too bad. It's actually in the middle of the pack. So, so there's, there's a lot of uh, opportunities for growth for, for Manitoba. Um, Kathy uh, also alluded to, uh, or Crystal alluded to, to the uh, seven principles. And uh, Kathy mentioned and how the seven principles are actually a Western concept. Um, the seven principles that you see here uh, on the left are, are what is called the Rochdale principles um, from, from England. And, and these are the principles that the traditional cooperatives um, uh, abide by and uh, it helps guide their decisions and how they operate their business uh, so that the cooperative is not just a business that is for profit but uh, has a social function as well. Now we 
in Manitoba, we took those principles and expanded on them. And, and hence, we have the 11 Nietzsche principles that you have on the right-hand side. And you would see uh, here with, with those principles, it's, it's a little bit more expanded. And it has a good focus on local, local reinvestment, uh, local skills, local decision making. And uh, you'd find that that is very essential in the creation of a cooperative, uh, let alone an indigenous cooperative, because it, um, it helps plug the leaky bucket and it prevents capital flight uh, from, from going. And the, the, the dollar that you spent uh, in a cooperative in Manitoba typically stays in Manitoba. Right. Uh, Jimmy? Yeah, and so, um, and that's, that leads us into this discussion here uh, in terms of um, what success looks like for Indigenous uh, communities. Um, so uh, this graph here, um, it's, it's borrowed from uh, a publication but that was published by Salway Black in 1994. Um, it's the, it's not her creation specifically, it's the creation of the First Nations Development Institute. And uh, what you have here is, uh, you have a, this graph that talks about what successful economic development looks like. So we don't have time to get into all 16 principles, uh, 16 uh, different dimensions here, but I just want to highlight, first of all, this is made off of, uh, based off the Cree medicine wheel. So there is no indigenous medicine wheel. This is, this is made by Cree people as an example of what uh, Cree people uh, would see successful development looking like. So uh, it's an example, it's not meant to be a pan-Indigenous approach, but it's a good example of uh, looking what successful economic, successful economic development looks like for Indigenous peoples. I just want to highlight here, uh, so it's, it's circular, so um, it's meant to symbolize the uh, holistic nature of looking at what success is. A lot of times people look at how many houses were built, how much money was uh, raised, uh, how many people are employed, which are good indicators of their success. But with this model, you have, uh, you're looking at the whole community, you're looking at the whole health of everyone involved, and uh, all the different factors are equal. So, um, yeah, so with that, we'll sort of jumping into the next slides here, we're going to look at these, the top four quadrants. Uh, so control of assets uh, is, is the first one. Uh, so we're control of Control of access, control of assets, spirituality, uh, kinship, and uh, and uh, that the last one. <laughs> so uh, for control of assets, so what are we talking about here? So uh, you know empowerment through the use of assets and wealth creation, as an example. So this is like this is really talking about the value of self determination and uh, the ability for the community to use their own assets to determine their own future. So when what we've done here in in the next uh, three, three or four slides is to compare this model that talks about what success looks like with the Rockdale, Rochdale principles and the Nietzsche uh, community economic development principles. And what we're doing here is we're visually showing the alignment between the values of the Rochdale principles and the Nietzsche principles, which are cooperative principles is essentially. Um, and so, yeah, just to highlight here, um, you know, even when you look at when the Rochdale principles were first created, it was created at a time when it was really important for people to, um, you know, be in charge of their own futures, their own self-determination, essentially. And so, um, and so that's why there's such an alignment between the Rochdale principles and this control of assets sort of element. So the next diagram is spirituality. And so this is, again, it's a really important part of what success looks like. So the, um, the values of seeing our relation uh, to all of creation, you know, the uh, the, uh, you know, looking at all of our relatives, you know, and, and uh, all of our relatives means like even the non-human relations. And so uh, spirituality is just a, a really important part of the health of a community. And so, um, the value of breaking them down into, into these four sections is that you're able to then, uh, you know, measure key performance indicators in your uh, community economic development and make sure, you know, because what the thing that's whatever is measured is the thing that actually uh, gets accomplished. And so, again, so looking at the comparison between this spirituality dynamic and the Rashto principles and the Nietzsche CED principles 
you can again see uh, that alignment, you know, between between these values. The next one that we're going to be looking at is kinship, and so uh, kinship again is a really important part of uh, of indigenous cultures. Many indigenous cultures see acknowledgement of a system of giving, sharing, reciprocity that exists within indigenous communities, and so. Um, this is seen again and again in many different indigenous cultures. It's also uh, you know, one of the main thoughts behind the treaties and the treaty making process. The idea of you know, mutual aid, like you sign a treaty so that you different nations can support and help each other. So kinship is really an in, in, uh, integral part of indigenous, of many indigenous cultures. And so again, with this, this kinship dynamic, you can see the overlap with the Rashtra principles and uh, almost all of the Nietzsche principles. The next one that we're going to be looking at is personal efficacy. Um, and so with this one, you're looking at, uh, you know, different levels, the personal level, the community level, and the, the national level. And the idea is, um, you know, personal growth and development for the purpose of benefiting others. So here, what Salway Black was saying in, in, in this section was, that growth for the sake of growth is not value. And so that's where you deviate from sort of a capitalist mentality where, you know, you want to grow for the sake of growing. Here, success looks like people growing personally, but for the benefit of others, for the benefit of the community that they're in. And, uh, you know, so, so there's different uh, key performance indicators when you look at the individual level, the community level, or the national level. And again, you can see these, these values reflected uh, significantly in the Rashto principles and the Nietzsche principles as well. So when you look at these three different uh, charts, uh, these four different charts, you can see that uh, there is in fact, when you just looking at this one model that was developed uh, from the Cree medicine wheel, you can see even with this one example that there is a lot of alignment between the, um, you know, between this particular indigenous culture and uh, the, the cooperative model in itself. And part of that is it includes, you know, looking at like how our decisions are made, what is the distribution of power, like how, how does a, a business operate? And, uh, and so this is a good visual of showing what that alignment actually looks like. All right. Uh, so thank you, Jimmy. Uh, be before we I've actually talk about this slide, uh, I would like to to tell everybody that our, our report um, is available. And I think Andre will, will provide you with a link. Now there's two versions uh, of the report. Um, one uh, is what I would call the long and boring version, uh, which is highly detailed. Um, and then there's there's a, a summarized version, uh, which was um, beautifully done by Kernil Aslan. Um, so, so Take a pick, well, whichever you read, you could start with the, um, with the quick uh, and fun version from Kernil um, and then go through our, uh, our boring version if you want to get more details, I would suggest. Um, yeah, so, so what did we find from, from this research? Um, well, number one is that the cooperative is generally, uh, is a valuable option, right? Um, Time and time again, uh, we find that uh, cooperatives have better longevity uh, than typical businesses. Um, and in some cases, they, the longevity of, of a, a cooperative, as opposed to a traditional corporation or uh, other types of businesses, is that they have community support and uh, uh, difficulty. That community support can actually uh, help uh, in some occasions, uh, cooperatives have actually been found to, wherein the workers themselves were willing to take pay cuts uh, because um, because the the income was actually low, and and for a, for the cooperative to continue, uh, everybody agreed to uh, to have a reduction in their pay. Um, it can mobilize the community to to lend support, and again, this is banking back on uh, the Nietzsche principles, wherein uh, there's cooperation among cooperatives. Uh, and it's not just cooperation among cooperatives, because on, on occasion, it actually extends to uh, not-for-profit organizations. And so uh, there's cooperation with cooperatives, as well as cooperation with organizations that uh, 
that delivers social uh, assistance to, to the community. And uh, then we also see something that I mentioned a while ago, which is the plugging of that leaky bucket. Um, we, we just recently completed um, or um, uh, Amazon Prime Base just recently um, uh, concluded. It was two days of sale. And I don't know if um, any of you actually engaged in, in that and, and availed of your nice deal there. Um, when, when you buy through Amazon, what typically happens is that you, you purchase a product which is not in Manitoba. And so your dollar goes outside the province. Um, and what that means is that there's this leaky bucket, bucket concept wherein uh, capital is, um, is, is leaking out. Uh, and, and we usually call it as capital flight. Now, in, in a cooperative sense, because there's cooperation among cooperatives and it's meant to service the community, uh, when you purchase your stuff from a cooperative, um, you, you, you keep that dollar within your community. Um, and, and as we've seen here, the, the model works well in situations wherein um, traditional businesses are not interested in, in providing the service uh, because it's not profitable for them. And so what happens um, is that the community bands together uh, and create the services for themselves. And you see this in, in Nietzsche um, in, in, their, in their neighborhood when they first started, right? There's just no food services or, or grocery in, in the neighborhood. So they've, they banded together and created the services for everybody. And same is true with the Northern communities. Um, however, we also noticed that there are some limitations to this. Um, we've, we've kind of alluded to the fact that there's an accessibility issue with the creation of a cooperative because it's a highly technical uh, process to, to go through and it's a, it's a legal process. Um, now, um, Sorry, Mark, <laughs> just, just for the interest, I'm noticing that we're going a little bit over time here. Mm -hmm. I wonder if we could just like jump over to the last slide here and uh, yeah. Let's just give over to the, the last the last one, just so we could move on and give uh, the others a chance. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Jimmy. Right. Yeah, so, sorry about that. No, um, no, it's, it's perfect. Thanks for. Uh, I, I do have a little timer here, and uh, it, it actually blanked out, but thanks. Um, okay. Uh, so, we have one one more slide, I think, after this. Right. Um, yeah. So so we found that there's a lot of synergies between uh, the indigenous cultures and the cooperative principle. Uh, one is that uh, there's this community goal concept, as I've mentioned, uh, wherein people help each other. Uh, the village concept, right? One of our interviews said that uh, it takes a village to raise a child, and such is true for uh, a cooperative as well, to, to be able to, to uh, have this enterprise which is prosperous. Uh, you'll find that it takes the cooperation of the entire village. Um, the privileged potlatch was was also another concept that came out wherein you you provide uh, your blessings to other people um, and in such a way that uh, you don't just benefit yourself or your your next of kin but uh, uh, the entire community right and of course the most startling is that there's really no lack of leadership and no lack of passion in, in the indigenous community to create a change. People know that there are opportunities for change and they're hungry for that. Um, and so a lot of people are willing to, to, to take up the challenge. Yeah, and I think it's really important to just mention those two concepts that we got uh, just to credit uh, Michael Champagne and just uh, those are, uh, yeah, great ideas and great insights into uh, the community here in Winnipeg. Um, and so, yeah, and just like, so our conclusion uh, here is uh, just, just if we were to walk away with sort of three main big points from the research, the first is that the cooperative model is not a magic book solution, but it does provide advantages that are not found in other business models. So it can create employment, service communities, when other models aren't incentivized, but there are still challenges in creating them. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in the uh, in this uh, event. Um, second is that indigenous peoples, like if we're looking at uh, what it means to indigenize something, indigenous peoples will indigenize whatever model that they use. However, we just wanted to highlight in this research that there is a high potential for alignment between co-ops and indigenous ideals, values, and cultures that may be reflected in how business is conducted. And lastly, the cooperative the cooperative model itself, like when we look at the Rochdale principles especially, 
Uh, they were originally created to provide autonomy and self-determination for their original users. And so that is a, that's also a key piece of alignment between why the cooperative could help us now in, um, in our current neo-colonial Canadian context. So yeah, that's, uh, that's a good summary of our project. And uh, yeah, we'll turn it uh, back to you, Crystal. Hey, thank you, Jim. And thank you, Mark. You know, I'm looking at this, I've really, really uh, forcing me to be much more reflective in terms of the work that I was doing, because it was happening almost simultaneously. I was doing the anecdotal on the ground meeting with community folks in terms of, of, of trying to figure out how we need to do this. And then it's really neat to see your uh, research is really um, complementing or um, confirming what I was finding is that people were, um, there was a lack of understanding of what um, cooperatives were, but there was a real understanding that there was huge potential and value there. So um, good on you for, for that research. Um, but before we move on, I know we talked a little bit about, um, you know, cooperatives are wonderful um, opportunities, I think. And, but there's lots of challenges in establishing. It's not as easy as it sounds. And Kathy, I know for sure you know the, how hard it is to establish a cooperative. But I want to pose the question to our authors is, um, what do you think some of those challenges are of establishing a cooperative? I guess I'll, okay. I'll jump in first. Is, uh, so the challenge of acquiring capital, I think, is true regardless of whatever business model that you use. And so that's, that's true of, uh, of capital as well, um, especially when you, when you look at some cooperatives. Um, that uh, One of the people that we interviewed were, was talking about how um, in his First Nation, it was, easy, it was easier for him to start a, a cooperative uh, just based off of you know, just getting uh, an old radar base and, uh, and, and just building it up from there. But I think that there, in today's context, I think there's a lot more barriers to entry. And so those exist, uh, like I said, regardless of what, uh, what business model that you use. So access to capital is, is one that I would say. Thank you, Jim. How about you, Mark, from your perspective? Um, what I can remember um, is our interview with, with Michael Champagne, actually. Uh, what, what he mentioned is that they don't teach you how to, in school, they don't teach you how to, to start a business. Uh, they teach you how to be a worker, how to uh, crunch numbers, but they never really uh, um, engage you in that entrepreneurial uh, process. And so for him, uh, when he was uh, like going through school, he was, he was very... He was very vocal, as, as we know him. Um, so he's a he's a great advocate. Uh, but for some of the kids uh, that that he noticed, uh, may not be as um, as a good an advocate as, as he is. And and sometimes um, the the training that they get uh, may not be geared towards the creation or um, um, it, it's not geared towards the vision of them being the business owners themselves, uh, because they never really learn how to create uh, a, a business proposal that you could bring to a financial institution so that you can get capital. That's what Jimmy was, was pointing out. And, and then I, I alluded to the fact that um, sometimes you need to get legal representation to just get your, uh, your, in, your constating documents for your cooperative, for example, right? And um, there's only, I believe, five lawyers who is in, in Winnipeg, who's um, who's capable of doing that, or has, has actually have experience in 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 drafting constating documents for a cooperative. Most of the lawyers are 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 familiar with creating a corporation, but not a cooperative. Yeah. I think um, so. You know, I don't want to be remiss. I know when we talk about challenges, we should always balance it off. With assets because we are a community full of assets and that's really important. So to highlight a significant asset and I know Mary was smiling when they were showing the numbers that were in Northwest Territory. <laughs> <laughs> so you are going to have your time my friend. Um, I'm going to turn things over to Mary so she can tell us about the Arctic Co-op and the success of the Inuit Co-ops in the Northern context. Thank you very much Crystal. So I, I am going to uh, get it from the um, Arctic Co-op perspective, um, Arctic Cooperative being in the Arctic Canada, uh, and some of the uh, successes that uh, 
a little bit more optimistic in what we do as a uh, Arctic cooperative. Um, we're very familiar with the challenges. Uh, however, um, Arctic cooperative and the cooperative movement has been around in the Arctic Canada over 60 years. And uh, Arctic cooperative is uh, uh, celebrating its uh, 50 years in 2022. So I am gonna go through the uh, presentation very quickly uh, only because of the time that we have. And um, usually I'm gonna cover uh, the various things in the governance, uh, geographic territory, culture, uh, people, uh, a lot of the discussion that took place today is very, we're very familiar with it already uh, in the, the territories and so on. Um, one of the things is the uh, Arctic Cooperative has seven um, board of directors. Um, they meet four times a year. All of the board of directors are from the, uh, the uh, three ter uh, two territories, Nunavut and Northwest Territories. Uh, we have an annual meeting. We actually just held it uh, about a month ago. Uh, we initially have them uh, in, in May. Uh, they come down from the Arctic Canada to Winnipeg to hold the annual meeting. Um, then we have the regional meeting that takes place. Uh, we call it President's Meeting and Regional Meeting. Talk about challenges. Um, this is from a uh, logistics side uh, where there are flying communities, uh, um, limited network system, but we, we make it work. Um, one of the things is that um, just to give you a perspective of where the, um, the Inuit community uh, have very similar challenges that are uh, a lot of indigenous communities take place. It was a reversal on my end because I'm used to making in the, in, in the communities, um, we action them immediately if, there, if there's challenges. Coming down to Winnipeg, I realized we're here in the provinces that you referring to I was like going back in time. Like I, uh, my, my head was spinning like, holy smokes, like that's where, where we need to do something here. But in Arctic Canada, um, it's, yes, we have challenges. We, uh, the communities went in from the uh, nomadic way of life to, to settlements, to residential school and various things. But the cooperative movement really reflected um, the uh, uh, values of the uh, Inuit and uh, Dene communities. So I'm going to reference very quickly of our members are uh, anywhere from um, Greece Fjord, uh, northern pro like in the sense of the northest, furthest north, Resolute Bay to Oak Road to Pangnirtu uh, to Sanikiluak. So geographic, uh, you cover the provinces, but it covers the, all the territories where our members are. Uh, and a lot of the flying communities that I reference is um, one of the things that challenges, talk about logistics. Uh, how do we get products into these communities and how do we fly in all the products into these communities and other things that um, uh, we talked about, uh, you talked about in the provinces that you may face, um, but we make it work. Um, one of the things is the Arctic Cooperative has a history uh, of, uh, initially we were based, they were based in Yellowknife they moved to Winnipeg. That's our home office here in uh, Winnipeg office. Um, so this is a, um, over time, it shifted um, for many years to see where it, uh, there's an arm called Arctic Co-op Development Fund. This is the uh, fund that actually supports a lot of the um, assets to inventory to new vehicles. So the fund actually uh, loans uh, to the member co-op um, in this particular area. I am going to go very quickly. 32 member co-op location. Uh, there's about 20,000 individual members and over 1,000 um, employees uh, across the Nunavut Territory, Northwest Territories, and Yukon. Uh, and it's, a, it's one of the uh, largest private sector in employing Inuit and Dene people. So what, uh, the first uh, cooperative that really started is through art, art marketing. Um, like carvings and various things when the community started to settle um, they were making carvings and various things and how do we market that product um, it's one of the things that that's the reason why a lot of the cooperatives started uh, in these communities so um, it really re valued the uh, Inuit values and and so on um, showcasing their uh, um, the culture uh, and so on but these are the thing couple of things that we actually um, uh, how the cooperative model started in very close to the, uh, the culture itself. That's why uh, the cooperative in the Arctic Canada is, is uh, where it's at today. I'm gonna to talk a, a very quickly as well of the early leaders. We had really strong leaders. Um, when it first started, John, um, Bill Lyle, I'm gonna put the book here. He authored a book about uh, how to start the cooperative. 
And uh, one of the things that he truly believes, the fact that if it wasn't for the co-op, we would have been worse off today. Because of the co-op today, Inuitsa and the Deni are successful because the economic benefit goes back right into the community. And I, I showcase my dad here. Um, he was my mentor as well, um, as well as uh, truly believe the fact that um, Inuit needs to be able to carry their own, uh, like in the sense of being part of the business. And so a lot of mentorship came into that at play. I know Vera's here today. He was our, um, one of the, his dad was uh, one of the founding uh, cooperative movement in, in the Arctic Canada. Um, so um, this is a couple of the histories that I am also referring to. Um, gender balance. Uh, we initially had a very good, um, like in the sense that early leaders were uh, tend to be male. Today, we have a very good balance in the governance model. Uh, the member cooperative in these communities actually, um, a lot of the uh, female are on the governance. Uh, very good uptake, um, which is very, it shifted over the years, but the women were always the leader, but never really on the board side. That shifted, which is so good to see on my end, uh, to see that there's a balance in there as well. <laughs> Uh, and one of the things is success is just showcasing some of the retail operations that we have. Um, and a lot of the th items that you see are flown in or by ship, uh, sh ship that comes up once a year. Just imagine the logistics side of that, uh, looking at from that, these communities. More, um, more, more items in there. I'm just going to quickly go through these. In Snorit, some of the, um, 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 the communities don't have hotels. They create a business um, from, that, uh, uh, from that side. Uh, the various um, businesses that the member corp tend to be in are some of the items that here. Invested uh, into the community. Um, these are the things that actually we do training. Um, small engine repair. Uh, the hotels that are safety food handling are some of the uh, trainings that we also assist uh, from the Federation. And one of the things is that uh, economic benefit. Uh, imagine the wage that goes back into the communities employing over, uh, I mentioned thousand, um, but there are the economic benefit back into those uh, communities and just uh, certification uh, training is so important that it's always I think part of sometimes it, get, it, it gets missed uh, from the employment side of things. So one of the other successes that we have, and we don't tell this enough uh, about it, is that recycle program. We don't have a recycle program in the Arctic Canada. How do we transport all those uh, uh, can uh, back to Southern Canada? And this is something that we truly, um, I think is one of the success, one of many successes actually, um, we uh, see can containers get shipped up there. How do we turn back those um, uh, pop cans? We fill the uh, sea cans, fill them in, in return, um, bring back, uh, donate the $1,500 if they fill it, and they could use that money to see what they want to do in their projects. And economic um, democrat, uh, uh, democracy, um, our, the member, 32 member location owns Arctic Cooperative as a federation. We get our direction from the members and uh, annual meeting is a way, one way that we get our direction from the members. Uh, some of the communities I'm just showcasing very quickly from there, uh, a lot of areas, uh, language was mentioned um, and uh, we have to be very cognizant of the, uh, the language of the uh, Inuit, uh, various Dene communities. Uh, I prefer to speak in my language, but I guess it's English is very prominent, but, um, um, but in these cases is uh, being reflective of the, uh, the language itself. So uh, I am ending there. Uh, thank you for the presentation and thanks for inviting me for, uh, to speak today on behalf of the, uh, the study. Thank you, Mary. Wow, there's, uh, you know, that you showed us just an array of opportunities and um, success stories of cooperatives that have, um, um, Arctic Co-op has participated in, in developing and working with in, in the North. So thank you very much for that. Uh, just cognizant of time, we're reaching noon. So we did have an array of questions. So we're just going to focus a little bit here. And um, the question I'd like to pose to all of our um, panelists today is let's talk more about the uh, cooperative models and the connection to self-determination. Um, you know, all of us are um, 
um, understand this between the research and, and our work that we've done in the community. Um, so let's start with Mary. Yeah, thank you. Um, I mentioned earlier in the presentation of the self-determination in the, in the community. Um, our early leaders were very strong and what can we do to support the community members from the foundation of the, uh, the community itself? And this is something that was driven um, rather than somebody coming into the community, so often in the community, somebody comes in, start a business, knowing in, they're not including the community, uh, they're not including the various things, they make the money, goes out. Mm -hmm. That is one thing that I would suggest is that include the community because they know their communities. We need to start including, um, I mean, we're here today in 21st century and we're finally talking about indigenizing the cooperative movement across Canada. So, thank okay, you. Mark, Mark, your thoughts? Um, I, I, would, I would suggest that um, what cooperatives bring Indigenous people is the ability to be economically independent. And there has been a lot of cases that if you look at BC where First Nations who, who are able to, to engage in business and become very profitable are, are able to, um, to, 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 to get more self-determination on what they want to do um, because they have the financial capacity to do that. And you'd find that they often, um, in some cases, engage uh, in, 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 in legal disputes uh, so that they could fight for their rights because now they have um, the, the finances to support it. Um, so um, having that cooperative uh, and having that business enterprise uh, to bring in um, income uh, for the community uh, is actually um, quite, um, quite liberating. Thank you, Mark. And Jim. So, yeah, and then just, just quickly before I jump in and answer that, I just want to make sure, I know that we're starting to lose people here, um, seeing the attendance drop, but I just want to let everybody know that uh, we are going to have another session. The session is going to take place in the new year. I know that, uh, so we're working as fast as we, we've been working as fast as we can to type our answers to some of your questions, but just let you know that we're reading them and listening to them, and uh, some of them are really great. And we can touch on them in the next session, but just keep uh, keep a lookout for the next session. It'll be in the new year, and uh, we're going to continue the conversation uh, and continue elaborating on it. So just uh, yeah, so just uh, just make note of that and keep looking for that, and uh, and we'll continue the discussion then. Um, and just to answer the question, I think uh, you know I think it's important also to consider that uh, when we're talking about um, economic development, we're we're not. Uh, making any ass assumption by any means that Indigenous people are not able to participate in the economy. I think that it's really important to recognize that um, even in our, our Canadian context, you know, uh, our colonial context, while treaties were being signed, you know, uh, you know, after the Robinson treaties, after pre-confederation treaties, and Canada starts to uh, work through the numbered treaties, in the middle of that process, it unilaterally uh, you know, just, uh, you know, launched the Indian Act and they applied it and without any consultation of Indigenous peoples. And so the Indian Act include, uh, you know, focusing us and restricting us onto reservations. We had the pass system, which uh, prevented us from leaving without permit permission. The permit system, which didn't allow us to buy or sell without permission. Uh, we had an inability to, uh, you know, to use lawyers to hire lawyers um, and, uh, you know, and severalty was another, was another policy. And so we couldn't work together to buy farm equipment, for example, and collectively own it and use it and work together. And so, and, and on and on, if you look at all the different policies, this is uh, one race specific policy that is meant to eliminate our participation in the Canadian economy. And so rather than honoring the treaties and allowing us to be equal participants and this brother to brother relationship that you see in the speeches when the treaties were being signed, you have this, uh, this, this approach that excludes one and, uh, and makes it a for and creates a forced dependency on the other instead of having both win. And so instead of having the nation the stronger, you have, you have one overpowering the other and they're both weaker. And so, I think that it's important to remember that context, that when we're talking about the cooperative 
as a means of helping Indigenous peoples participate in this Canadian economy. It's not to do with anything uh, that, uh, that we ourselves are lacking. We're coming back from and we're recovering from these Indigenous specific policies. And so um, it's, it's a way for us to go back and to undo some of these policies that, uh, that restricted our First Nations, restricted our communities. And uh, it just allows us to, uh, you know, to take the next step of uh, rebuilding our nations. Thank you, Jim. And Kathy. Well, I think, um, I think for us here in our community, in the Indigenous community here in Winnipeg, co-op models would be very successful in, even in, in the terms of housing. As we all know, housing in the city here has been a huge problem for our community. My own family came here in the city in the 1950s and I can tell you the housing was pretty bad and it's been bad throughout the years and still is bad. And a lot of our young people don't have decent housing. A lot of our seniors don't have decent housing. And I think that, you know, doing it in a cooperative uh, model would be so much beneficial for our community as well as it would create jobs and it would create a very cohesive kind of community and, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, we've been looking at trying to develop a seniors co-op for, uh, for our 55 plus people here. And um, it, it's, it's going to be a lot of hard work. And uh, I, I'd like to throw out a challenge to a lot of the young people out there uh, that are that's listening to our webinar. If, if they're interested in helping us develop our seniors co-op, hey, the more help, the better. We aren't getting any younger, as you can tell, and we do need a lot of more young, energetic people who can be involved in, in doing a, a co-op. And uh, we do have a vision for, for our co-op, for our seniors, and uh, I think it's a very positive one, which. Thank you. Well, um, cognizant of the time, it's 12.06. I wanted to uh, take this opportunity to thank everybody for participating in our session today. Um, I understand that there has been links provided in terms of providing you with the full document as well as a summary condensed version. And um, this will be available also, the item, at, sorry, the, this webinar has been recorded, so it's also going to be available as a webinar for others to view. So thank you very much, everybody, and um, wish you well, and uh, take the time to read the document. There's some really good information there, and um, I'm a strong advocate for um, cooperatives. I think it's a model that could work. For our community and, and Mary has demonstrated very well how it's worked in hers and um, I think we need to consider this moving forward and um, really bring awareness to the issue and that's to me that is one of the biggest things is we need to focus on how do we even make sure that the our Indigenous citizens of Winnipeg even know and understand what a cooperative is because that was that some of that basic stuff still needs to happen. But thank you and have a wonderful, wonderful day. Okay. Thanks, everyone.